You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! You may not be able to handle the truth, but these guys can. Welcome to the Long for Truth Show. Heretic hunters. Hey, what do you think of these guys? I think they're damned and on their way to hell, and I don't think there's any redemption for them. You think, frankly, that's the way I think about it. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to please turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. And some of you may know that I've preached from this passage of Scripture, or at least from this chapter anyway, at least three times to my knowledge since I've been coming up here to Capital City Rescue Mission over the past few years. But tonight we're not going to look at a portion of the Scripture itself, or at least a passage in in John 6. We're going to focus on three particular verses tonight. But before we get started, before we get looking at these verses, I want to ask you a question. And I don't want you to answer this question out loud, just keep this to yourself. And here it is. Here's the question. Do people, sinners, people like us, do people have the ability to choose Christ and be saved? Do people have the ability to choose Christ and be saved? I'll ask it in another way. Is a person able, by their own efforts, their own will, and their own desires, to come to Jesus Christ for salvation? The answer to that question, at least according to Jesus in this chapter, is no. No. God is the one who does the choosing. God is the one who chooses or no one will be saved. And so I'm asking you tonight, has God chosen you for salvation? Are you chosen by God? The New Testament and especially Jesus throughout the Gospels, talked often about God choosing. He talked often, he talked often about the elect. The Apostle Paul and his epistles, and almost every one of them, also talked often about God's choosing certain individuals for salvation. The Apostle Peter and his epistles talked about it. The Apostle John and his epistle talked about it. And James... And his epistle talked about it. And the Old Testament is filled with passages that talk about the sovereignty of God and His choice over certain people, namely Israel. So let's look here at three particular verses that deal with this in John chapter 6. And these are very important verses because Jesus makes it very clear that it is God the Father who is in control. I saw on my way here tonight a bumper sticker on the back of a car that said, try Jesus. As if Jesus is something we can try and we don't like Him, we just toss Him away. No, we we don't try Jesus. We either come to Jesus in repentance and faith and live, or we don't take Jesus at all. There's no middle ground. So let's look at John chapter 6. Let's look at the first of three verses tonight. Verse 44, Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one can come to Me 
unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now let that sink in a moment. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now the New Testament was written in Greek originally, and this word here that's translated no one actually means not even one man, woman, or thing, none, nobody, nothing. It is absolutely emphatic. There is not one single person, Jesus is saying, who can come to Him unless God does something first. There is not one person, I don't care how moral that person is, I don't care if that man is a good man, if he is a man that pays his taxes every year, a man that never cheats on his spouse, his wife, a man that never, uh, you know, never uh, steals, lies, a man that is involved in all kinds of social ministries. It doesn't matter. No man. It doesn't matter how moral they are. Jesus is saying, no one, not one, not one person, no one can come to me. The word can here is another interesting word in the Greek. It's the Greek word dunamai. It's where we get our English word dynamite. And it literally means power. Jesus is saying here, no one, no one has the power. Not one person has the power to come to me. Now why is that? Why is it that no one has the power to come to Jesus? Well, the Bible gives some metaphors, and I'm going to give at least three, that describe our sinful, our spiritual condition. The first metaphor is death. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what does it mean to be dead? Paul meant spiritually dead, not physically dead. There are people walking around outside of this place, inside here, that are spiritually dead. They're alive physically, they're spiritually dead. Why? What does it mean to be spiritually dead? It means a person has no natural desire for God. Oh, he might might have the, the fleshly desires for God, because the people here in John chapter 6 had fleshly desires... They had just been fed. This, the same people that Jesus is talking to here. The previous day was just fed with a miraculous meal. They were fed by Jesus. A crowd of 5,000, not including men and women, were fed by Him by, with five loaves and a few small fish. And they ate of this meal, and they ate till they had their fill, and there were 12 basketfuls left over. And the crowd saw this and took part in this, And when they saw it, they were going to make Jesus king by force. And so Jesus withdrew himself, sent his disciples across the sea. And this is the very next day where they find many, or some of the crowd finds him in the synagogue teaching. And they come to him and they say, Master, how'd you get here so quickly? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You're not coming to me because you saw the signs. In other words, realizing I'm your Messiah. Realizing I'm your Savior, He said, you're coming to me because you ate the loaves and had your fill. That's not miraculous. Anyone can come to Jesus that way. There are going to be many people in churches, in all churches all over the country tomorrow, sitting in pews who are dead in trespasses and sins, because they come to Jesus, not for salvation, but so that they can get something from Him. That's not genuine faith. And that's what Jesus is saying here. No one can have that kind of faith unless it is given to him. It's it's a miraculous faith, faith wrought by the Spirit of God. It is easy and natural to be religious. It is easy. We can come to Christ 
And we can, we can embrace Him to get things from Him. I used to teach Bible studies in Hampton Roads Regional Jail. And I would have guys inevitably come into that Bible study. And they were there not because they wanted to find out about Christ. They were there not because some of them, not all of them, but some of them were there not to find out about Christ, not because they were interested in Jesus or religious things, but because they had a court date coming up. And they wanted to be a little religious. And they wanted God to go in there with them and walk in that courtroom with them and give them a favorable answer from the judge. That was their whole purpose. And I used to tell them, guys, if you're only coming here See, because you got a court date coming up, you're not really following God at all. You're not really coming to Christ. You see, that's not genuine faith. Genuine faith is this. I realize I'm a sinner. I am under the wrath of God. I am going to die in my sins and go to hell unless somebody does something. Unless I am saved. It is the Spirit of God opening the eyes of people and showing them that they are sinners. We think we're good people. That's the problem. I watched a show. No joke. I watched a show. Uh, I think it was like a 48 hours episode. It's been years ago. And they went into death row. Some of the most hardened criminals who had done heinous crimes, horrible things, and they asked them this question, some of them. They asked some of them this way, they, they picked a few, and asked them this question. Are you a good person? Are you a good person? And almost every single one said, yes, I just had a rough life, or yes, I just made some bad choices. We think we're good. The Bible says there is none righteous, not even one. So that's the first metaphor. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. Let me say this. You can walk up to a corpse sitting in a coffin. Okay? And you can yell at that corpse. And you can shake that corpse. And you can poke that dead body. But that dead body is not going to move. Why? It's dead. It's dead. And we, although we're walking around born, those who have never been born again, are walking around spiritually dead with no desire for God. Not the way at least Christ talks about in the Scriptures. The second metaphor that's used, a couple of chapters later in John chapter 8, Jesus says, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Second metaphor, slavery. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 said, you used to be slaves to sin. You used to be slaves to sin. Slavery implies bondage. Something that you cannot stop doing. And here's the odd thing about slavery to sin. The odd thing is, people don't want to get out. They love their sin. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. Men are born, men and women are born dead in trespasses and sins, and they are born slaves to sin. And the third metaphor is really not a metaphor at all. Really, the third metaphor is just a statement of fact. Jesus said to the Pharisees, You are of your father, the devil, and you desire to do your father's will. So our state, our spiritual condition, is we are in dire straits because number one, we are dead in trespasses and sins. Number two, we are slaves to our sins. And number three, we are born children of the devil. And that's why Jesus says, no one can come to me. No one has the power. Not even one person. Like I said, people can come to Jesus for ulterior motives. There's nothing that, that, that that's not miraculous. But to come to Jesus realizing that you're a sinner, realizing that Christ is your only hope and your only answer, that's something that the Spirit of God does. But then he says something here that is amazing. He says, no one can come to me unless, unless, The Father who sent me draws him. 
Now this word draw is also an interesting word in the Greek. It literally means to drag. 